Dr. Angela Dills is the Gimmelstab Landry Distinguished Professor of Regional Economic Development at Western Carolina University. Prior to joining the faculty at Western Carolina, she held faculty positions at Clemson University, Mercer University, Wellesley College, and Providence College. She is a labor economist whose research focuses on the economics of education, crime, and health. Her research addresses a broad array of important policy issues, such as school choice, the importance of peer effects, college quality, and drug and alcohol prohibition. Dr. Dill's research has been published in top economics journals, such as the Journal of Health Economics, Economic Inquiry, the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, and the Economics of Education Review. Angela received her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Virginia and a Master's and PhD from Boston University. She resides in Franklin, North Carolina with her economist husband and three children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dills. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, before I, I really get started today, I wanted to share a little moment I had this morning. My oldest child, my middle schooler, um, was supposed to sing in his all school chapel this morning, much to his horror. And <laughs> so I was tuning into their live stream to see if I could catch him singing. They've been preparing the hymn, All the Poor and Powerless. I was able to watch him sing. But uh, more fortunate for today, I, we'll see, one of them's on. More fortunate for today, I was also able to catch the end of their chaplain's message today. And the, the way I'd summarize Chaplain Mary's message was that none of us are whole unless each of us can flourish. And I thought, well, that's particularly apt, both for my talk today and for us all being here at Acton. I was really struck by how effectively she conveyed this message to a group of school children uh, in a very, a very similar message to one I hope to convey to my students and to you all, uh, but in a very different way than, say, an economics professor would. So <laughs> I, I really came to appreciate Acton a little bit more this morning for their work in educating a variety of communities, a variety of communities who are reaching out to a wide range of audiences and sharing that message of how we can use economics, we can learn economics to help our communities, perhaps particularly the poor and powerless. So uh, thank you to Acton for having me. I'm very honored to be a part of that. I do have a clicker. Great. My clicking. Here we go. I'm going to talk today about creativity. Now, I know I said I'm an economist, so you'll have to forgive me for just a moment, but <laughs> I am going to talk about creativity. Should I point here? There we go. Um, many of you may know Neil Gaiman. He's a science fiction fantasy writer. Uh, I, I love reading science fiction fantasy, and he has this lovely short essay that he includes at the back of some of his books. I, I came across it a couple years ago when I was reading Anansi Boys. And in this essay, what he's doing is he's answering this question that he frequently gets asked, which is, where do you get your ideas? I'm going to share part of his answer with you. He writes with a bunch of examples I'm going to omit, quote, you get ideas when you ask yourself simple questions. The most important of the questions is just, what if? Another important question is, if only. And then there are others. I wonder, and if this goes on, and wouldn't it be interesting if, end quote. He, go on, he goes on to describe writing a story by saying, sometimes it won't work, or not in the way you first imagined. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Sometimes you throw it out and start over again. I was struck by the passage because writers and artists share that creativity, that risk of failure with other entrepreneurs, with other innovators, with people who create new products, with people who innovate new ways of doing business, with people who found new businesses. They too ask themselves questions like, what if? And those questions can lead to changes that are life improving, that are beautiful, 
And those questions can lead to changes that make all of our lives a little bit better. Tom Nelson captures this in his book, which I highly recommend, called The Economics of Neighborly Love, when he writes, when we make things, we reflect God and express love for our neighbor. No matter our age, God created us to be creative, to serve others, and to work. To minimize our unique creativity is to diminish the God who designed us in, our, in his image. Each one of us has the capacity to be creative and to reflect God with our creative output. We should organize society so there's space for that creativity. This should be our default. We should let people craft new forms of expression or generate new solutions to problems we face. We should let people work together to find solutions to challenges we have, whether they're little challenges or big challenges, because each of these improvements allows us to flourish and leads to economic growth. Each of these modest improvements enriches our lives a little bit more. But what we need is we need freedom and individual liberty to express those visions, whether they're artistic or entrepreneurial or some combination thereof. And one of the big things that creates space for creativity is being able to start small so that the ideas that aren't beneficial never become too big to fail because sometimes it just doesn't work and sometimes you have to throw it all out and start again. If you can start small, others can choose to adopt or not your new idea so that the creators can expand their audience or their business or their availability to customers. Business people can grow in the direction that consumers desire most. Let me introduce you, thank you, to Isis Brantley. Isis Brantley is an African, expert African hair braider She in Texas. She's had decades of experience braiding hair. She works with everyone from people whose hair has been damaged by the use of chemicals to Grammy award-winning artists. Um, and, and she's taught, in addition to braiding hair, she also teaches other people how to braid hair. She teaches African hair braiding to everyone from out-of-work women who are looking to start a new career to state-licensed cosmetologists who are looking to expand their practices. In 1997, several undercover officers entered Isis's hair braiding shop and arrested her for braiding hair without a cosmetology license. So yes, officers with guns arrested her for braiding hair. What does a cosmetology license require? It, in Texas at the time, it required 1,500 hours of training and courses. Training that included how to cut and dye hair, which Ms. Brantley does not do. And even though most cosmetology schools don't actually teach at the time hair braiding. So she had 1,500 hours of how to be a cosmetologist. In addition, because she was an instructor of hair braiding, she had a whole other host of regulations she was expected to comply with many of which did not apply to her trade. The state of Texas required her to do three useless things. She had to have 10 barber chairs installed, whether she used them or not. She had to have 2,000 square feet of floor space, whether she used it or not. And she had to have five sinks, even though Texas braiders are actually prohibited from offering services that require a sink. Uh, in addition, as to become a licensed barber school instructor, she needed another 750 hours on top of the 1,500 hours learning to teach barbering and passing exams, both written and practical, on barbering instruction. Now, Isis Brantley is fortunate in that with the Institute for Justice, she successfully sued the state of Texas. This led the state to repeal the instructor's license and for the state to completely deregulate the practice of hair braiding. So it's a nice story to share because it has a happy ending. It isn't, however, a particularly representative story. Texas's move to relax these entry restrictions is counter to the current trend in occupational licensing. In the 1970s, about 5% of the workforce worked in an occupation that was covered by an occupational license. Today, it's about 25%. So one in four workers work in an occupation where they're required to have an occupational license to practice their occupation. But these kinds of licenses raise the cost of entering an occupation. They limit entry and competition, and they limit the bounds of creativity. Because creative ideas 
artistic, scientific, or entrepreneurial often start small, and many fail. Restrictions like occupational licensing are particularly binding for small businesses, for one-person shops, for that individual trying to enter the workforce or re-enter the workforce, someone who's new to an endeavor and learning the ropes. Regulations are particularly binding for small businesses because they feel like fixed costs, so they're proportionally larger for a smaller business than they are for a large business. For example, when the Food and Drug Administration, when the FDA uh, started regulating pharmaceuticals, this led a lot of small businesses just to stop investing in research and development, and larger pharmaceutical companies benefited from these regulations. Laws like occupational licensing restrict people's ability to work together to creatively solve the challenges we face, whether they're big or small, whether they're challenges you even know you're facing. So. How many of you have a car? I have a car. How many of you are current? So that was almost everybody, maybe everybody. Uh, how many of you are currently using your car? Hopefully, well, really? <laughs> as far as I can tell. OK, this guy, is, he's driving. <laughs> so, um, yeah, right now you're not currently using your car. Perhaps it's particularly true for me, right? I flew out of the Atlanta airport. My car is sitting in a. Um, in a parking garage at the Atlanta airport. Um, why not use my car? Those are just idle resources. My car is just sitting there. I'm paying for parking. I'm paying for insurance. And yet, my capital is just sitting in a parking lot not being used. Why not? One of the things that a lot of the sharing economy allows us to do is to use some of those resources more efficiently. Turo.com, for example, would allow me to rent out my car while I'm traveling for work. Someone else could pick it up in that parking garage and drive it, paying me for a few days, and I could make better use of those resources. Now, maybe that there's some risks to that, right? I might be particularly concerned that some young, reckless driver wants to drive my minivan. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> But particularly if you had a nice car, you might be concerned that someone or is not going to care for your car as well as you would, might drive it a little less safely. And so these websites do what everybody else does on, in the sharing economy, right? You can rate your driver, rate your car rental agency. You can rate your um, borrower. There's some requirements for car insurance. Turo will cover your extra insurance for you. Uh, and they have ways to kind of get around some of those challenges. Okay. A challenge maybe you didn't even realize you had. Right. Any of you used Airbnb before? Or VRBO? Yes. StubHub? Yes. Tool City? That's a newer one. I don't know. So, <laughs> um, so lots of these Lots of recent entrepreneurial innovations are, are happening in the sharing economy, right? Turo.com allows you to rent out your car, parked at the airport when you're traveling out of town, or just parked wherever. Airbnb, VRBO, let you rent out extra space in your home or even your entire home when you're not using it. StubHub lets you resell tickets that you don't have the opportunity to use. Tool City lets you borrow power tools that maybe you don't want to buy yourself, which I think is really neat, too. But all of these are permissionless innovations, innovations that violated our rules and customs, rules that said, don't let strangers in your car, rules that said, don't let strangers in your house, um, for example. But changes that are now possible. And all of these changes enrich our lives. And they do so, in this case, by making our capital, our homes, our cars, our power tools, our, our assets usable during a longer period of time. They're using technology to lower the transaction costs of finding someone who's interested in using our capital, our other assets, our homes, our cars. Okay. I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about a specific permissionless innovation ride-sharing, and specifically Uber. Ride-sharing is not new. People have carpooled for decades. When I, I, I grew up mostly in Northern Virginia. Uh, 30 years ago, it was very common. I hear it's also still common for people to do what's called slugging. So what this looks like is you 
people go to predetermined locations, typically bus stops. They line up, and as others are driving into Washington, D.C., they pick up some extra riders. Okay, so you can uh, sort of, why do you want an extra rider? Because you want to use the high occupancy vehicle lane. So you want to drive in the HOV lane, so you pick up a couple extra riders who also want to go into the city, and you tuck them in your car, and you go on. Okay, uh, so this is like early form of ride sharing, right? So ride sharing takes it just a little bit further, which is that they take the technology in your smartphone, the geolocation services in particular, so that instead of having to line up in a predetermined location, you're ride sharing and you can match wherever you are, whether that's at the airport or coming out of the bar or whatever. Okay, all you need is your smartphone. And there's a lot of benefits to that innovation. Okay, drivers benefit. They can use their capital, they can use their car that might otherwise be idle themselves, that might otherwise be idle to pick up a few hours of work here and there. They can decide how many hours they want to work and when they want to work. And when they, the use of passenger ratings gives them some reassurance as to the quality of the people they drive around. The Uber driver I had on my way from the airport yesterday told me he know, he goes he likes to hang out by the airport because there's fewer intoxicated people and he'd much rather deal with airport riders than people getting around um, the lovely place of Grand Rapids, which I can't imagine these people are <laughs> y'all are too nice for that. But. Um, but the passengers also benefit, right? We have more options on how to get from point to point. So that means we wait less time. We have a larger coverage area. Uber is more willing to go in places that maybe your transit system doesn't go or some taxi drivers might have chosen not to go to. Okay. And we get ratings of drivers too. So we have some reassurance that the person driving us is of a reasonable quality. Uh, there's an economist who works at Uber who's written a paper with a handful of other economists who estimates how much consumers have benefited from Uber. And their estimate is that in 2015, consumers benefited by $6.8 billion over and above what they paid to Uber. So that's what economists would call consumer surplus. But the, the gains from trade that consumers um, att attained from the existence of Uber in one year were $6.8 billion. It's um, pretty good benefits, right? So the drivers are benefiting. The consumers are benefiting. Uber presumably is benefiting, right? They're offering, uh, their app generates revenues to the firm, to its owners. The peak load pricing provides some information to drivers as to when it's more or less profitable to drive, as well as information to potential riders as to whether it's more or less costly to ride. Uh, and so there are lots of benefits to Uber, um, to the company, to the drivers, to the consumers. And yet, Uber experiences a lot of pushback, right? There's some of it's in the media and public opinion, some of it's in regulatory backlash, some of it's coming from different locations trying to regulate Uber. And it's a great case example because innovations frequently attract regulation. In Uber's case, arguments for the regulation tends to be one of two types. Frustration that Uber is not subject to the same regulations that the existing taxi and limousine companies are subject to. Um, and concern about risk to the public from innovation. Frustration of that first sort, this desire by the taxi industry, by the government to regulate Uber like taxis, these laws that they're looking for primarily serve to protect existing incumbent firms, typically larger firms. Occupational licensing, such as that faced by Isis Brantley, works in a really similar way by restricting change, by limiting the entry of newcomers in an industry. Like many innovations, uh, Uber displaced existing technologies. In this case, the taxi industry faces increased competition from the existence of Uber and Lyft and other ride-sharing services. Right? And those incumbent taxi drivers, they are worse off. We, one estimate of how much worse off is that incumbent taxi drivers experienced a decline in earnings of about 10%. That's kind of a, an upper estimate because some of those taxi drivers also now drive for Uber. So some of it's offset by them switching who they're driving for. But 
those taxi drivers are worse off. They were protected from competition and their earnings have suffered as competition has increased. That's the dis destructive part of the creative destruction, right? So <laughs> But some of this concern and sort of the motivation for the paper I'm going to talk a little bit about, some of the concern driving regulation comes out of a societal concern for the potential drawbacks to an innovation. Let me go back one more. When we witness innovations, we want to ask ourselves if there are any risks and if those risks outweigh the gains of the innovation. Detractors of ride sharing, for example, expressed a lot of concern about reduced road safety and the increased crime. Uh, and my research, which is joint with my husband, Professor Sean Mahullen, addresses these concerns. And the questions we ask are what effects did ride sharing have on traffic fatalities? What effect does ride sharing have on crime? We were, like I'm sure everybody does, yelling at the radio one day when they were sort of talking about a, a terrible incident that had happened. A driver had assaulted a rider, or there was a terrible crash. I, I don't actually remember. But the newscaster said something along the lines of how terribly dangerous it was to have these ride-sharing services. And then I sort of started, you know, arguing about the news <laughs> and decided, well, the nice thing about being an academic economist is we can answer the question, right? We don't have to... Um, hypothesize about the effect of ride sharing on traffic fatalities and crime. We actually have the data and the statistical skills to go and figure out the answer to that question. So we did. We went and we collected a bunch of data, and I'm not going to give you an econometrics lesson, although I would love to. But <laughs> um, we went and collected a bunch of data on where Uber entered and when Uber entered into various counties. We matched it up uh, as uh, we matched it up with data we already had on, and that is publicly available on arrest rates for a variety of crimes and on fatal traffic accidents. And we asked, using pretty standard statistical techniques, did the counties where Uber entered experience different trends in fatal accidents and in arrest rates for crimes that are plausibly related to the entry of Uber? Um, did they have different trends in those effects than counties that didn't get Uber? Ideally, we also, in, in some of our specifications, we excluded places like where I live. I live in a town of about 4,000 people. There's like one draw guy who drives a cab in the three-county region near us. So like we don't have Uber, right? <laughs> so probably we shouldn't be in the sample. Uh, so if we look primarily among counties that are eventually going to get Uber and compare what happened to fatal accidents and arrest rates for crime in those areas, we find generally that they declined. Everybody needs a little Latin in their life. Um, we find generally that they declined after Uber came. Let me go one more. There we go. Specifically, what we find is we find fewer traffic fatalities. We find fewer arrests for assault. We find fewer DUIs, driving under the influence. Um, and we find higher vehicle thefts. Let me talk about the good news first. So when we compare the counties, what we're finding is, well, what is Uber going to do? Well, Uber ride-sharing services kind of do what you might expect them to do. They make it a little cheaper for you to go out at night and a little cheaper for you to in indulge in alcoholic beverages than you might otherwise do so. Okay? So there's lots of possible things that might happen. Right? If, the, if the overwhelming thing that happens is that instead of driving yourself home from the bar drunk, you call an Uber, that's great. Right? But if the overwhelming part of what happens is that lots more people are going out and drinking and some of them are calling an Uber, then that's less good. Right? And so we can ask this sort of question of what's the net effect? What's the overarching effect of having more people going out drinking and more people using ride-sharing services? And on net, we find that it's positive. The roads are safer, fewer people are dying, fewer people are driving under the influence. And something like 70 to 80 percent of assaults are alcohol have alcohol implicated in them. It's a heavily, um, it's a really common thing for people to get drunk and get in fights, and that drives a lot of the assault rates here. And so, assaults are also decreasing. 
we find some bad news. We find higher vehicle thefts. It's very robust over all the different ways we do it. We find increases in the number of cars that are stolen over this period of time. And the basic story we have um, is that people go out, they drive their own car out to the bar, they drink perhaps a little bit more than they intended, but smartly call an Uber instead of driving themselves home, leaving their car on the public thoroughfare and more susceptible to auto theft. That's the story. We don't have supporting evidence for that other than that we see these increases in motor vehicle thefts. But that's the story that's consistent with the pattern of evidence that we find. I had a young student when I talked about this paper in his um, class at Berry College who came up to me and said, yes, it's totally consistent with my uh, experience before Uber came to, to Barry. We, my friends and I, we'd go out to the bar, we'd get drunk, we'd hang out on the street, we'd get in fights, someone always got in trouble, and then you know, we had to get home. And his professor at the time was horrified that he, this student is sharing the story with me. But, um, <laughs> but anecdotally, is also consistent with the evidence that we see nationwide. Okay. And, and I would encourage, I think this is a great role for academic researchers, people worry with innovation. Innovation attracts people's concern because it's new and it's different. And it's OK to ask those questions. In fact, it's great to ask those questions as to whether we're on net better or worse off. But we have the tools to do that. And I love that I can use my research interest to actually answer those questions as well. Maybe. So innovation does make people nervous, maybe permissionless innovation, this kinds of things that are violating social norms and the way that sharing economy tends to particularly makes us nervous. Uh, but instead of remaining nervous, what we need to do is ask the questions and find the answers. We need to examine whether those changes are actually beneficial on that to society um, or not. It is disruptive. Innovations are disruptive. That is the benefit of innovations, is that they are disruptive. Those are benefits that we need to consider. Uh, and we don't get those benefits unless people like Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp innovate. Unless people ask themselves questions like, what if we are already sharing carpool money with our friends and gas money with our friends? What if we expand those scopes? What if we expand that to include our strangers and people we've never met? Which brings me back to the beginning. When we have scientific advancement, artistic innovations, economic growth, we rely on innovators. We rely on creators. Permissionless innovation, creating new things first, asking forgiveness later if you need to. Permissionless innovation improves all of our lives, whether that's Uber, whether that's Isis Brantley and her hair braiding entrepreneurial activity, whether that's Neil Gaiman writing a lovely story to read on a Sunday afternoon. Each of these people is bringing something new into the world, just as each of us in this room are on earth to be creative and innovative. And that creativity may turn out to hugely affect our lives, how we think about using our homes or our cars. That creativity may beautify our lives, encourage us to connect with our friends and family by uh, using new stationery or by braiding hair or doing other, uh, generating new crea careers. Lots of ways that small changes can affect all of our lives, both big and small. And we as a society can choose to make that easier or choose to make it harder. Occupational licensing, regulation of industry, those kinds of laws make it really costly for a small business to begin, for a person to start a new career, to change a career, to try their hand at something new, to meet a need in the community. We can strive for a regulatory environment that's more conducive to creativity. We can also strive for personal environments, for a civil society that welcomes creativity. Instead of meeting new ideas with skepticism and doubt, we can support creative members of our communities and give others the liberty to make our lives more prosperous, fulfilling, and full of beauty. Tom Nelson also writes, each one of us has the capacity to be creative and to reflect God with our creative output. And it's that creative drive that brings economic growth, that benefits all of us, 
the creative person and society as a whole. That economic growth that stems from creativity has reduced global poverty in ways unimaginable 50, 100 years ago. Um, and we should all encourage it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dells. So um, we have time for Q&A. So if you would, just raise your hand if you have a question. And then uh, please speak your question into the microphone so it's recorded. Dr. Dills, question for you about occupational license. Mm -hmm. Is there a, it seems that there might be a similarity between unionization and kind of the work rules and the prohibition of growth and supply of labor. And well, at least from the old perspective of like the old plumbers unions and the carpentry unions mm -hmm. and occupational license. Is there, just curious your thoughts on that. That's a great question. So um, they work in very similar ways, right? So unions, labor unions sort of effectively is trying to limit entry into certain occupations and increase the wages as people are paid. That's fundamentally the role of a labor union is to increase wages, um, typically through restricting entry, which is a, basically what occupational licensing does too. Um, Private sector union unionization is on the decline. It's much less common for people, for uh, an employee to be a member of a private sector union. It's a little less so for public sector unions. Uh, <laughs> public sector unions, if you look at the strikes that have happened, say, in the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of them are teachers, right, which are public employees. But there's um, someone who's on strike, and I can't remember who, GW, uh, UAW is on strike this week, yes. Um, so they operate very similarly. What I would say is that occupational licensing is a much more dominant force in labor markets in the US today than unions are. Um, but they've kind of flipped their roles, right? Unions used to be one in three in the workforce. Now occupational licensing is kind of taking that role and unions is much less common. But they work very similarly. Hi, my name is Laurel. It's nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for coming to Grand Rapids. Um, my question is, as you look at the pushback on this permissionless innovation, mm -hmm. um, do you think it truly is um, for kind of the societal good and helping people and keeping people safe, or is it more purely from a regulatory protectionist standpoint? And depending on which one, what is our action item? Like, what can we do to move past that? Great. So my, my first response to that is it reminds me a lot of, kind of Bruce Yandel's Baptist and boot, yeah, bootleggers sort of theory. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. But it would be really hard for the taxi industry to come out and say, well, I think you need to regulate Uber because it's terrible for me, and I think I, you know, which is true. And some of them have said this, particularly in places like New York City, where it's been very costly for people who own taxi medallions to have that increase in competition. They made those investments not expecting that increase in competition. It's a lot easier to say, well, we need to regulate Uber because it's not good for public safety. It's not good for the roads, right? So. I suspect most of what you're going to see, whether it's self-interested or not, is going to sound like protecting public safety, right? But it's really hard to untangle whether that's their moral intention or whether they're just there for sort of the bootlegging aspect because it's increasing their income, right? Um, and I'm not sure that it, I'm an economist. This is a thing we really struggle with, right? So economists are really into what actually happens, right? Good intentions or ill intentions. What matters is are people better off or not? And um, my research suggests they're better off, and we need to be pushing that, right? But 
I, I understand economists are not good sellers on this margin, right? We're much better off. This is why Acton is so great, right? We're much better off sort of having that moral argument to us, right? Which is highlighting all the people who do benefit from it. I think they're just scare tactics, right? It's not like bad things don't happen in taxi cabs or on the public transportation, right? Bad things do happen. It's just we're used to those. We know about them already. It's not something new and different that we're learning about and trying to figure out. And so I think we're people just in general are uncomfortable with change. And that's, that's, I think it's human nature. But we need to sort of increase that comfort level. Are there any appropriate boundaries ever for creativity? And now, and even thinking outside of just government, I know you talked about regulation, government kind of regulation, but even outside of that, especially you, you bring up the moral issue. Um, are, yeah, are there ever appropriate boundaries or limits that could be set? And if so, who ought to set those? So I'd say yes. I think you could be very creative in coming up with new ways to like destroy the, the, the army you're fighting, right? We could come up with new kinds of weapons. And as a private citizen, maybe that's, well, even as a government, maybe that's not great creativity, right? It's destructive, it's harmful, it hurts other people. Um, I had heard some nice talks from John Hasness, who's a law professor, I think, at Georgetown. And his argument is all of that can be resolved through tort law. That if, in fact, you're creating something that's going to hurt people, which I think is an appropriate bound, maybe a very a light bound, but an appropriate bound here, then we, we should have the right through the judicial system to stop you from doing that. Speaking of the like the regulations, you know, the Journal had a pretty good article a couple of weeks ago about California is really cracking down, trying to crack down on the gig economy, as they call it, Uber being one of the bigger ones. And uh, kind of in connection with that, I don't have the particulars, maybe you can help me, but being a number cruncher, um, the last earnings report that Uber issued was, I mean, it's hard to believe this, okay, and what they're losing, for every dollar in sales, they're losing, what, 40, 50, 60 cents, something like that. So... With that, with the headwind of the California, for instance, and not even withstanding that, what is your opinion on their ability to turn the corner and someday, whenever, become profitable? Uh, so a couple of things. First, I always feel a little bad when I say the part like Uber benefits from having this because there, there is this sort of weirdness about it that they're not actually a profit-making endeavor yet, right? Um, yes, so, so I find that... Um, interesting that they have, can survive for as long as they have through, I assume, venture capitalists and others who continue to invest in them. But um, So that said, it does sound like I had a really enlightening conversation with my Uber driver, as I always do yesterday. <laughs> he says that they've changed his compensation scheme over the last few years in ways that all sound like um, them trying to increase their profit margin to, you know, they're cutting how much they're paying drivers during surge pricing and things like that. They're cutting sort of some of their super fun workplace benefits to the people who are there. Um, whether that's enough to, so I think my question, their strategy seems to have been come into a place, get enough people sort of attached to using Uber on a regular basis that they have this base of voters who will support them when the city sort of backlashes and wants to regulate them, right? And the pricing kind of serves that role, right, by making it a little more attractive to driver riders to kind of participate by using the Uber instead of whatever their original uh, uh, other options were available to them. But I think in the end, it's going to mean they, they're going to have to raise prices, right? They can't. Um, Presumably, they cannot stay in business forever losing money. And they shouldn't if they're going to continue to lose money. That's the beauty of the market. If they're not actually able to make money at the prices they're at, then um, they shouldn't stick around. Whether to invest in Uber or not, I don't know. <laughs> um, my question is 
relating to is there a momentum to the society, to the culture that allows creativity? I, I don't remember the movie, but I saw a movie in which um, every time anyone had a unique idea, they were hit in the head with a shovel. <laughs> okay. And so the point of the movie was is that pretty much everyone was walking around looking like a shovel, but no one ever per talked about a unique idea. So clearly there's a balance. However, isn't there a momentum to a certain amount of creativity to a society? And we can see societies that don't allow that and what the result is of that. So I'm gonna take your, like culturally, do you think that, do I think that we are in a creativity enhancing kind of environment. I think in some parts of the country, probably, I think certainly in Silicon Valley, things like that, like there are innovative pockets of people who are really encouraged to be innovative. Whether that's consistently true, I think it's actually, um, you heard my really long title, right? I'm this, this whatever, professor of regional economic development in Western North Carolina. I spent a lot of time talking to our economic development people in the region we live in. And there's a lot of people whose basic job is to help people who are thinking about starting a new business negotiate all the things they need to do to actually comply with regulation. If you want to open a new restaurant or um, you know, become a building contractor or something like that, they, they sort of help them negotiate the process, which on top of everything else, so there is a process, and then we hire pe public employees to help people negotiate that process. It's a really expensive thing to do, and it's very challenging. Uh, I would say more so than it was 30 or 40 years ago in the US. I think it gets, it's getting worse, not better. Uh, I think there's a lot of space for improvement. Hi, I was wondering about one of the services you mentioned early in your talk, the, the Turo service. Mm -hmm. um, I know absolutely nothing about it. It certainly doesn't have the, the high recognized uh, uh, status of, of Uber, but I'm wondering, did, does that service, is it growing rapidly? And if so, how is that impacting services like, like Uber? Is that cutting into Uber's a niche as well as to the, to the rest of public transportation? I don't know what their growth looks like. Um, they only serve a limited number of cities, so uh, although I think that list is growing, um, I suspect it cuts into Uber as well as into car rental agencies. I think both of those things, I mean, it's just providing you other options of how to get from point to point when you're in a new city. So I presume that's all cutting into each of these businesses, which is great. I mean, there's other, other business models that um, provide new opportunities for people to get where they need to go. Maybe not good for Uber's earnings, though. <laughs> so. Thank you, Doctor. Do you think the wages of Uber and Lyft drivers are going to equilibrate with those of the taxi driver industry, or is it going to be like a winner takes all, and by the end there's going to be like one man standing? I think that the answer to that question depends on how successful they are at getting government regulation in their favor. So I think that to the extent that it may stays relatively unregulated, that there's space for all of that. If some people want to call a taxi, some people are fine with Uber, um, some people want to drive for Uber, some people want to sort of go the taxi company. It's probably going to depend a lot city to city. Uh, so that's sort of one question about the drivers and sort of different question about the companies maybe. Um, but I could certainly see some locations where the taxi industry might successfully put Uber out of business. So. Hello. Uh, I wanted to know as, as you took a look at your statistics, if you took a look comparatively at three levels of government control and transportation, uh, being public service or, or uh, public transportation, taxis, and ride sharing, and comparing the safety, quality, and customer satisfaction of those three. We didn't, but I think that's a great question. So sort of how do customers compare on those margins? There is a really 
there's a nice paper by Joe Price and a couple other people that looks at how places within a subway system with an existing public transit system, how Uber affected those places and ridership. And one, they find, in fact, that more people are riding public transportation when Uber comes to a, an area because they can use the Uber to get from their house to the station and then use public transportation to get into the city. Um, so I, I think partly my answer is it's not, they're not necessarily substitutes for each other. In some ways, they're complementing each other, particularly public transportation and Uber. Uh, you know, the great thing about private enterprise is you have to be responsive to your consumers, right? Um, Government-run public transportation, they have to be a little bit responsive in the sense that, you know, they need to keep getting funding, but the market requirement to satisfy your consumers doesn't exist, right? So I would assume that people are happier with, in more, consumers are happier in more competitive markets. I'd like to know if there's a, a minimum level of restrictions. I want to make sure the mechanic fixing my brakes knows which end of the wrench to pick up. So I'd rather have a 28-year-old experienced guy than a 14-year-old teenager who's a great neighbor. So there's got to be <laughs> some restrictions somewhere. Yeah, so... One option, so I agree with you, like there's a trade-off here in, 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 in that I'm in a position in my life where I like high quality services even if they cost a little bit more, right? Um, the question is, is that for some people that means not getting it at all, right? Because by raising the price, it then puts it out of reach for them. So one way we can have the, both of those things is instead of having occupational licensing, we can have, and, and some occupations have this, we can have certifications that aren't required to practice your, your occupation, but could be a selling point to your consumers. You can say, oh, instead of saying I have a cosmetology licensing, you can say I'm a graduate of you know, Redken School and I have these special certification in hair dyeing or whatever, or in the case of mechanics, I've, I, you know, I've got my associate's degree, I've got this special training from Michelin or whoever it might be to sort of be a break expert, right? Um, that doesn't, consumers certainly like that, just as you're saying, right? You, you, you would like to be able to verify the quality of the service you're getting provided. If that's generally true, the providers will provide that information to you, either in the form of having some kind of certification that they can give to you that's not required but is optional, or through word of mouth, through reputation, all of those things matter too. And the benefit of doing it that way is that if I need a mechanic and I don't have a lot of money, I just need to get my car running enough to get to school, I might be willing to pay the 14 year old down the street who's kind of handy with cars, right, to sort of fix it so I can get to work, right? Um, but you price those people out of the market if you require them to have a license. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is it seems like the structure of a lot of the sharing economy is based on reviews. Mm -hmm. So the investment, the, the motivation that's working for the practitioner, whatever they're doing, or the person lending out their capital, um, is reputation-based, and the, and the investment comes after the fact, whereas Professionals who are licensed make an upfront investment, be it in schooling, time, etc., and then um, is there a way that that changes behavior into where that investment is made, whether it's upfront? I think I, I taught in public schools for a number of years, and I had friends who went through teacher certification programs, taught in the public schools, I had friends that did not go through such programs, went into private schools, and what I generally saw is that the people who went to the certification program lasted longer. And this wasn't 
because they were smarter people or more able teachers, but they had enough invested up front that those first couple years when teaching is challenging and you're learning how to do it, they stuck it out. Where these other folks hadn't made that upfront investment, a lot of them exited teaching after just a year or two, approached a different profession. So it, it struck me that those two different models, I mean, they both you know, had supervisors, they had people evaluating them, they had, of course, students. But it struck me that, that, this, that the professional folks who made that upfront investment had a different attitude towards their work and vocation than those folks that were evaluated after the performance of the task itself. Yeah, so I, I like the thought. You, I like that description you provide. I think there's something valuable to that. I mean, certainly people who know that or are pretty sure that you want to go do something for 20 or 30 years are more likely to make that investment up front and then stick with it. I think that that's completely consistent with what you're saying. Um, I think there's a little bit more to the incentive structure difference between public and private school teachers, which is that the public school teachers are also more likely to be eligible for a pension if they stay long enough in teaching, right? And so there's a huge financial incentive for them to live through the low paying years to get to the high paying years and the pension, uh, which happens much less than the private sector um, for teachers. So I think the incentives there are really interesting. As an academic, my, my mind went a totally different direction, <laughs> which is that the tenure structure sort of behaves like this upfront investment versus the ongoing kind of rating system that you get in the sharing economy. And you know, there's a lot of really intrinsically motivated people who go into academia. They do it because they love it. They're going to keep doing research and teaching great because, you know, they love their job and they love what they're doing. And then there's the handful of bad apples, right, who, like, there's no reason to keep working, and so they just kind of mail it in, right? Um, the benefit of the ongoing rating that you see in the sharing economy is you can't just keep mailing it in. Your reputation suffers, and you're out of riders, right? Nobody will take a ride from you, or nobody will borrow your, you know, rent your house anymore because you're, you know, providing a dirty, uncared for home. Um, so I think there's some selection that comes from the upfront investment, but I think the incentives from providing, providing ongoing ratings also has sort of a, an effort effect on the workers. So, fun economics there, though. I'd, I'd like to uh, have you explore a little more the idea of uh, there being a, 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 some sort of a threshold at which uh, mm. below that, uh, yeah, I think the government has a place or licensing procedures have a place. Uh, <clears throat> if I'm going to rent a suite in a building, I'd like to know that certain electrical standards set by the government were adhered to, that the, the people who... Uh, who did that, did the work, uh, were, were licensed, had met certain requirements and so on. Uh, so uh, wh where would you say that indeed there is a, a desire or there a good, a, uh, an absolute uh, necessity in some cases, if we're talking about medical services, for example, where government intervention and involvement is, is the best thing? So I like the example you give of like electrical work or something like that in a building. And I think maybe one difference from between that and say, you know, renting someone's home or staying in a hotel room or ride sharing uh, is what you're concerned about isn't visible to you, but could cause a real harm to you, right? You can't go and inspect the electrical wiring of every building you go into. And, and I think there's some, I, I, I think you could make the argument there that we need some way of documenting the safety of things that are not visible to the consumers. Um, you know, do we need to license florists and, and, you know, other people whose work, hairdressers whose work we can see the effects of fairly easily? It's not clear that that's true, right? Um, but could you draw a line there of things we can and cannot observe as consumers? Possibly. I'd be open to that. And I think in medicine, you're going to be a little careful there too, right? Because sometimes, you know, if I'm getting a hip replaced, 
you know, we can see who, how many times you've done it, how many times a provider has done that, how successful they've been, how, you know, you could ask for that kind of information in a more open sort of medical market uh, and make decisions accordingly. Are you willing to pay more for higher, you know, more experienced surgeons and the like? Um, but something like a hip replacement may be very different than emergency care that's being provided without the opportunity as a consumer to evaluate that. So I think there's some lines there where there's a bigger and smaller <coughs> argument to be made for regulation. Hi, thanks again for the talk. Um, uh, my question is about congestion, traffic congestion, not physiological uh, congestion. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I believe it was specifically in New York, but Uber was being criticized for adding to traffic in the roads. So the roads are being, you know, nobody's able to get anywhere because of Uber now. Um, and Uber's response struck me as disappointing because I'm very pro ride sharing and gig economy. and I like this stuff, but uh, they said, well, you know, yeah, we have added some more cars to the road, but we don't really think it's that many. Um, but that's not how traffic works, right? Like, it's not a linear function of you add, you know, say you have 10,000 cars per hour or day, or I don't know a realistic number, but uh, on a given road, and you add 1,000 cars, it doesn't mean 10% more traffic. It's more like there's, uh, you know, you get to a point and you, you reach that straw that broke the camel's back. And instead of just a little bit more, you get this spike, and now nobody's going anywhere, uh, this kind of bottleneck um, problem. Um, so I'm curious about that. I don't think that's enough reason to regulate or get rid of ride sharing. But I'm curious if, if you looked into that aspect of the argument against Uber or for regulating Uber, maybe be a, a more accurate way of putting it. Um, and, and if that seemed to be a major concern in any uh, certain lo localities. So for us, a lot of the conversation about vehicle miles traveled, so how much cars are on the road, is whether we should put it in the, whether we should control for it or not in the regression, right? And in the end, we did not, because exactly what you're talking about. So it's not obvious, actually, that what Uber does is increase cars on the road. It could just fully substitute for driving your own car for taking an Uber, in which case we wouldn't see any change. Um, but generally, we do see increases in cars on the road with Uber. People are Drive, taking an Uber to the public transportation, which has both effects, and people are going out more because they can take an Uber home and things like that. So um, I think the, the question that occurs to me is that that's not unique to Uber, right? Like, yeah, we should care about traffic congestion. Perhaps we could even think about pricing driving on the roads like we do with toll roads, but that's not Uber specific. That's specific to you and I when we decide to get in our cars and drive too. We're also potentially causing congestion. We're also potentially that straw that breaks the, the roads back, right? But, um, so is it increasing cars on the road? Probably, it looks like it in most places. Um, should we do something about it? Maybe we could do something about it for everybody, right? I mean, we can, like New York City and other places have congestion pricing. That's fine, right? We should charge people for using the resources they're using instead of you know, letting them use it for free so they can sort of drive accordingly. So. Okay, this will be our last question. Don't you think that the, um, I think the idea of when to regulate, it's the risk of failure. Mm. If my hair falls out because my stylist put the wrong stuff in or did my building burn down because of a bad wiring job? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so how high could the potential harm be? Um, I think that's reasonable. I think that that, I mean, I think that kind of fits with the military weapons, sort of weapons of mass destruction kind of story as well, if we're particularly concerned about it. The, um, the bigger question is, is regulation there also, well, another question is, is regulation the right way to deal with those concerns? Or is sort of a, a, a tort system that would make someone really hesitant to engage in those behaviors that would be harmful enough to deter that behavior? 
Uh, and, and I think that you know, there are other mechanisms that might be more efficient, more responsive to changes in the market than regulation. So thank you all yes, for your thank questions. Thank you, Dr. Nelson.